Welcome to Nagarik Network. Today we are here with Sebastian Marokin, who is an architect, author, and also happens to be the son of Pablo Escobar. Well, I was seven years old when he told me that he was a bandit. As a father, uh, how was he? Sad thing, he, he didn't uh, practice all the advices that he gave me. The first time they see me, they think they are going to see another show of narcos. I think if you are smart enough to be a drug dealer, you have enough intelligence to be a good man and to be a successful man. So welcome to uh, Kathmandu. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. So is this your first time to Nepal? Yes. Very happy to be here. You have a lovely country. So how did you like uh, the city? Well, I walk a lot and I like the, the people who are very gentle and kind. Have a great time here. I hope you will be able to come back again. Yes, I will. I will come back. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your childhood. So you have said in your previous interview that, uh, you know, you, when you were growing up with your father, uh, very early on, you know, you, your father made it very clear what he was doing. So how did that impact your childhood? Well, I was seven years old when he told me that he was a bandit and that was what he was doing. And at, at the age of seven years old, you don't understand exactly what does uh, uh, the word means because he was just the head of the perhaps the biggest criminal empire of the last century. So if you think about it, I couldn't realize what he was really doing. But of course, after he told me that, he didn't have any problem to say uh, or to take any uh, all the responsibilities about the news we saw about him uh, together. So it was kind of a hard for me as a kid because I was too young and I didn't understand what was going on and we have to uh, get away from our country and to go to exile. We, we hide a lot from the police because of his actions. Um, as a father, uh, how was he? He was a good and loving father. He gave me good advices, but sad thing, he, he didn't uh, practice all the advices that he gave me when I was his son. Did you get to spend a lot of time with him? Some, some time, but not too much as a father because he was on the run like for the last 10 years of his life. And you lived as a kid, you lived in this tremendous you know, uh, wealth. Uh, you had everything at your disposal. So how, as a kid, and you know, when you're having your friends around you, so how was it like to live in that luxury? Well, that only lasts five minutes if you compare that to a whole life, because the thing is that the series that I, the Netflix or some uh, other people are showing about my father, they took that five minutes of joy and they are saying that my father lived of his life uh, even as a success case, and I don't think it is. I think my father wasted his life in a way. He only enjoyed like 10% of his life. He died when he was very young, 44 years old. So, uh, of course, uh, you don't notice when you are enjoying a lot, but that didn't last too much. Uh, violence came very early to our lives, and we, has, we have to run a lot. So you were the last person that your father talked to before he he died. Yes. Um, so did you have that sense that now he was going to be, you know, that was going to be the last conversation with your dad? Well, I I knew that he was making a big mistake because he was like, um, you know, breaking his own his own golden rule. So he made uh, some calls and he knew that the authorities and enemies will find him. I was trying to protect him, and I couldn't. So your father died in 93? 1993, so you December were 16. 2nd, yes. So when your father died, you said that you will take revenge of uh, those who killed your father. So what made, but you didn't do that, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what made you change that? Well, it took me 10 minutes to realize what I was about to do uh, if I took revenge for my father's life but I really didn't wanted to do that because I didn't want to bring more violence to my family and also you end up writing letters to the families and kids who were you know killed during that uh, the war uh, 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 drug war in Colombia and so and then you end up meeting them also so how was that experience what prompted you to write letter and then finally meet them 
Well, I took the moral responsibility of my father's crimes because I think that somebody should ask for forgiveness and somebody should apologize for all the violence that all the victims of my father suffered in the past. So I wrote a letter for them and since then, and thanks to the documentary scenes of my father, I had the opportunity to meet them in person and to chat and have a very honest uh, dialogue and talk to them, ask for their forgiveness and make peace with them. Uh, so uh, in that time, nobody talked about peace and reconciliation in my country. Everybody wanted to solve things through guns and violence. But I found out that these kids were very open and kind to receive me and they understand that it was a good thing for the country to forgive but it's not the same that to forget. We didn't ask to forget what happened in the past, which was asked for forgiveness. So after your father died, you were also the victim. So you had a price tag uh, of $4 million. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so then you, you had to, you know, with your mother, you had to you know, go to places before finally uh, you know, yes. settling in Argentina. What was that experience like? Well, you feel dead, even if you're still alive, but you feel that your life is uh, not going to be uh, too much longer. So it was difficult times. We have to give all the money to our father's enemies so they don't kill us. And that's how we stay alive. And so and then you, you decide to change your name. What made you change the name? Well, the world literally closed all the doors for us as a family. No country in the world allow us to come. So not even the Vatican or the U.S. Uh, or the United Nations or the Red Cross, nobody wanted to help us. So we ran out of options to escape from Colombia's violence. And the only way out was to change legally our own names to have the possibility to escape from there. Uh, do you have a plan, to, if you could, to go back to Colombia and, and live the rest of your life there? Well, I wish that someday uh, five million people of uh, Colombian people could have the right to decide and choose to return to our country. And I mean five million people because I'm not the only one, the only one outside of the country for the violence. Because I just think that we should all have the right to decide that before the, the violence uh, will decide for us. So you were exposed to drugs early on. So yeah. did that ever tempt you to take drugs? Well, my father educated me very well about drugs. He warned me about the consequences of taking them. So uh, he did that very early. So I had the opportunity to say no to drugs since I was very young. So you're not tempted? No, I think when you have a good education and, and you know the consequences, you will say no. You've been going out and you know, sharing your stories with, with people all over the world. So what message do you have to people you know, who are into drugs and this young, you know, there's a huge problem everywhere. Yeah. So what, what, what do you tell them? Well, sadly, uh, the way that the net networks and the streaming platforms are portraying my father like a hero is, it's a huge mistake because they are encouraging a lot of people from different cultures around the world to follow my father's uh, footsteps. So my work here and everywhere is to deliver a message to the youngest ones to encourage them to follow a good path and not my father's path because uh, they are thinking that my father is it is a success case and as i told you i don't think it is and uh, i think if you are smart enough to be a drug dealer you have enough intelligence to be a good man and to be a successful man so uh, that's my point and I, I'm just trying to use in a very responsible way my story to leave a message of peace and reconciliation to society and to invite the youngest ones uh, to be aware, to make them all aware of the consequences of having a life like my father's. So how when young people meet you in these events all over the world, how do they react? What is their first reaction? Well, I think th the first time they see me, they think they are going to see another show of narcos, but that's not the, what I'm doing. Uh, after the, the presentation, after the lectures, they, they really understand 
what I lived through and they pay me attention and they respect my story and my decisions in life that to be an architect and not, not a gangster. And so they, they can see me as an example for their lives. When, when you see these big cases of this, you know, the criminals being arrested in these drug cases, mm. uh, uh, what, what, what goes in, in your mind? We just see different names, but the same problems everywhere, in every country. And nothing is getting better. We have been trying for the same um, formula of prohibition for the past 100 years. And you can see the results, a lot of bodies, a lot of violence, a lot of corruption and uh, nothing really changed and so I think that the world should at least uh, take a minute to meditate about what was going on with the prohibition process in the world mm -hmm. and perhaps we should use education as the best weapon we can use to not to solve the problem because I, I don't think that even if you prohibit or legalize or do anything with drugs, they will be always there to, because a lot of people like them, sadly. And so they, there is a huge market that you cannot destroy just because you prohibit something. So a lot of countries, including the US, they have come to legalize marijuana, for example. You know, so their hope is that if you legalize it, the people will use it responsibly. Is that what you're saying in terms of other drugs also? I think that prohibition is the best propaganda to uh, ask the people to try something. Mm. When something is legalized, nobody cares, so nobody will pay more attention to that. It won't be as fun as it was when it was prohibited. So I think now the governments, uh, at least uh, some of the United States um, states has like some legalization, legalization and 50% of the United States has already legalized marijuana. But you know, from the, all the Latin American and the Mexico example, it's not legalized and everybody's dying there for uh, the marijuana and the drug trafficking problem. So we have to, as I think that the world leaders have to talk about this and to make a, a world deal about how are we going to manage the, the, the drug problem in the world because a lot of Latin Americans are dying every day, thousands of them, and this is because prohibition. I think that we should declare peace uh, on drugs. Since your father war. died, has the conversation on drug issue in Colombia changed effectively or has it become better in terms of you know, people not using drugs or has it become worse? What is your sense? about Colombia, what's going on now? Yeah. Well, nothing changed. Nothing we changed. have more drugs now than ever in my whole country's story. So uh, the problem is getting worse every day, not getting better. There's no solution with prohibition. We already tried that many times and just more corruption comes and more violence comes. So if you could go back to uh, Colombia, what would you want to do ideally? Uh, I just want to stay there in a peaceful way. I don't want to uh, be involved in any activity more than as an architect or industrial designer or helping the youngest ones to be aware of the consequences of violence and being involved in the drug trafficking business, but not else. No. So you have a family, you have kids? Yes, I have a five-year-old son. So w what, do you, what do you, when they ask you about their grandfather, what do you tell them? Well, my, my son is too young to understand uh, the drug trafficking business, etc. But of course he knows, he is, uh, his grandfather is Pablo Escobar and um, I've been just starting to speak with him. I have a huge responsibility of raising him with a lot of love and awareness of the consequences of trying to be like his grandfather. So I hope that he will have enough information when he's uh, old enough to take his own decisions and it's a great responsibility to uh, make him aware of this and so he will choose the right path. Do you think over time that your father's image will change the way people see him? I really don't know. It's, it's just a matter of uh, most of the people don't take my father's stories seriously. It's just a business. It's just a name that sells a lot. Uh, so 
they don't care about the consequences, but I do because I can see the consequences, at least through the social media I receive every day thousands of messages. People send me pictures of my father or they make tattoos or they, they said to me, oh, I watch Narcos and I'm a big, huge fan. I, now I want to be like your father. So fun. I'm sorry, man. It's not, no, no fun there. So how do you want to remember your father? Well, I think that we should all thank him for uh, showing us the path we should not take. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I hope you'll come back to Nepal and enjoy this place. Excellent, man. Thank you.